When analyzing rock climbers with neck and shoulder pain, a mobility assessment is a key component of the clinical exam. Now here's a list of several different mobility deficits that are very common with rock climbers. Now there's many other mobility deficits that a climber may have, but these are some of the key factors. And remember, we can check these in isolation, but also combined and composite motions may also be necessary when assessing different components of a climber's mobility. But let's go in depth into a couple of these key components as it relates to rock climbers. So first, scapular mobility. I want you to take a look at this assessment. As you can see here, I'm grasping the scapula. I'm then shifting my body, creating scapular abduction and upward rotation. And I'm feeling to see if there's any resistance to motion during that technique. Let's watch that again. I grasp the scapula. I shift my body weight and I abduct the scapula and I upwardly rotate, seeing if there is any resistance of the tissues. Now, which tissues do you think would be limiting this motion? Which soft tissues do you feel could limit this motion? A mobility deficit in the rhomboids may lead to inadequate scapular protraction and upward rotation when the climber is reaching for a hold or looking to clip a draw. Now let's look at humeral external rotation. You can check at 45 degrees, you can check at 90 degrees, you can also check it at 135 degrees. One final position as well, you can check it at 180 degrees. Now what are you biasing when you test the shoulder at these different positions? Well we have the subscapularis muscle, we have the pectoralis muscle, latissimus dorsi, as well as teres major. These are the internal rotators of the shoulder. When we're testing at 45 degrees, we're biasing subscapularis. At 90 degrees, pectoralis major, clavicular fibers, as well as the joint capsule. At 135 degrees, pectoralis major, sternal fibers. To further differentiate latissimus dorsi and teres major, you can take the climber's humerus into greater degrees of shoulder flexion, up to 180 degrees. If you see the scapula slide away from the spine or slide away from the thorax, then you can suspect that teres major is contributing to this mobility deficit. If you take the climber into end range shoulder flexion and you notice they arch their spine or they flare their rib cage, you can determine that potentially latissimus dorsi is playing a role. Now a mobility deficit in any of the internal rotators of the shoulder can lead to inadequate humeral external rotation while a climber is reaching and can lead to decreased subacromial space. So let's now look at a muscle length assessment of pectoralis major, both the clavicular and the sternal fibers. For this assessment, I place the climber's arm across their chest, I grasp the distal end of their humerus, I stabilize their arm into their thorax to prevent rotation, and I bring their humerus into horizontal abduction. I then raise their arm into 135 degrees of humeral abduction, and I test again horizontal abduction, checking for tissue resistance as well as overall mobility past neutral. It is fairly common for climbers to have excessive mobility in their pectoralis clavicular fibers in that 90 degree position to horizontally abduct past neutral. And this is not a movement that is natural during climbing. Sometimes if you're in a dihedral and you have to stem with your upper body, you'll have to hyperangulate your shoulders. But this excessive mobility actually can cause capsular strain and can leave the anterior joint capsule lax for rock climbers. Now in contrast, when a climber's shoulder is taken up to that 135 degree position and we're testing the sternal fibers of the pectoralis major, oftentimes climbers have a shortness or a stiffness of these fibers of the muscle. And it would then be advantageous in this 135 degree position to stretch out the muscles because it is a common position during climbing and since the muscles are stiff and the shoulder is unable to get to that neutral position, it is a great way to increase the mobility of the pectoralis without causing excessive strain on the joint capsule. Pectoralis minor is another muscle that oftentimes presents with a mobility deficit with rock climbers. Here you can see assessing pectoralis minor, the climber's acromium is marked with a red dot 
you can take a measuring tape and measure the distance from the acromion down to the table. Normal measurements are 2.54 centimeters or one inch. When performing this technique, you can do so with the elbows extended or the elbows bent. If you perform it with the elbows extended, make sure that the scapula isn't anterior tipping from a short biceps short head or a short biceps long head. Since the biceps short head attaches to the coracoid process and the biceps long head attaches to the superior glenoid tubercle, a short muscle can cause anterior tipping of the scapula and give the perception of a stiff pec minor. So how does this relate to rock climbing? Well, a mobility deficit of the pectoralis minor can lead to inadequate posterior tipping of the scapula while rock climbing. And this occurs oftentimes during reaching. This can then lead to excessive glenohumeral hypermobility and a fulcrum at the glenohumeral joint. So as you can see on this image on the left, a stiff pec minor can cause a decreased posterior tipping of the scapula, which then means the glenohumeral joint has to excessively flex. And with excessive flexion of the glenohumeral joint, you'll notice asymmetric creases in the posterior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. And you can compare these side to side. This is oftentimes easy to visualize as well in the clinic with having a climber stand in front of you and go into bilateral shoulder flexion. And if you notice inadequate posterior tipping of the scapula, and you see excessive fulcruming in the posterior aspect of the humerus, you then will need to follow that up with some type of laxity test, a load and shift test, or something to assess if there is excessive hypermobility of the glenohumeral joint. And then the climber should be put on a pectoralis minor mobility program, as well as a glenohumeral joint stability program. A mobility deficit that climbers often present with is a short or stiff posterior cuff or posterior joint capsule. Here's a modified Tyler's test. The clinician will stabilize the lateral border of the scapula into the table. They'll grasp the climber's distal radial ulnar joint and they'll horizontally adduct their humerus with a normative value of the elbow reaching the nose. The clinician will appreciate the end feel, whether it is a firm capsular end feel from the joint capsule, or a firm muscular end feel from the posterior rotator cuff, they'll need to determine which structures are creating that mobility deficit. Now a mobility deficit of the posterior cuff can lead to an anterior humeral glide in rock climbers through a concept called obligate translation. This was identified in a Harriman study, and it showed that a tightness of the posterior cuff can lead to anterior shoulder pain and a migration anteriorly of the humerus. The humeral head will translate in the direction opposite of the tightness. So almost imagine a slingshot or some type of hammock that is pressing that humerus forward, squeezing it forward from a stiffness or shortness of the joint capsule or the posterior rotator cuff. The latissimus dorsi is a muscle that needs to be screened in rock climbers. Now in order to assess the muscle length of the latissimus dorsi, the clinician will grasp the distal humerus of the rock climber and they will monitor the rib and the lumbar position into end range humeral flexion. As you can see here, as the climber is taken into end range humeral flexion, the rib cage lifts and the spine arches. We can then assess the relative flexibility of the muscle by stabilizing the thorax and the rib cage and taking the climber into end range. And here you can see that they no longer can achieve their full mobility. So in that first example, we saw the relative stiffness of the latissimus dorsi muscle. As I brought the climber into humeral flexion, we saw that his rib cage expanded and his lumbar spine arched. In the second example, when I stabilized the rib cage, the climber was no longer able to achieve maximal shoulder flexion, indicating a muscle with a mobility deficit. And this concept of relative stiffness is so important with rock climbers. I used to always think rock climbers, they have such tight lat muscles. They have such tight pectoralis muscles. And I would stretch them and stretch them and I would overstretch these muscles. 
And what was really the difference was they had an issue with relative stiffness. The stiffness of their pectoralis muscles as well as their lats was greater than that of their midsection or their core. And when the climber was then climbing and reaching into these end range positions, they'd be hyperextending and fulcruming through their lumbar spine, and they'd start to develop some overuse injuries in their shoulder. So we went through a lot of different mobility assessments for climbers. There's many other components that I look for in rock climbers when I'm assessing mobility, but these are a few good ways for you to start understanding the main muscle groups that can get short and that can get stiff with rock climbers and how to assess them in a rock climbing specific way.